not really escape from that. So it's impossible as a, a Finnish architect to become a Brazilian. Huh? That's not just the way it works. And it's also difficult, let's say, to make out of a Protestant architect a Catholic one, because this is also obviously not so easy. So and I think in that way, I think the lecture will also be a little bit about uh, uh, Germany and uh, German culture and, let's say, the meaning of Germ Ger German culture within the European context. Um, Tessino uh, was an architect born in 1876, and he belongs to the same generation as uh, Peter Behrens and Adolf Loos. So he's actually a little bit older than the real uh, modernistic avant-garde, like 10 years younger than Le Corbusier and uh, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, but he is really one of the guys who, let's say, prepared with his work the architecture of the 20th uh, century and made a quite important uh, contribution. And I think he grew up in a quite complicated situation because he was born, I mean, Germany was founded, I think, 1870, I should know, but somewhere in the 1870s. <laughs> and there was a sort of enormous industrial boom around uh, that time. Capitalism was growing like hell, and what was really happening was there were enormous uh, big cities growing everywhere with huge uh, proletarian uh, uh, population. There was a lot of uh, uh, industry, especially in the, in the rural area, and let's say um, one of the results of this kind of uh, development was an extreme change of German culture in this period. And let's say maybe the most dominant result of this change was the production of the Mietskaserne. So that means, uh, let's say, a housing type that was introduced in Berlin, but also in other German cities like uh, Leipzig and so on, where you basically made in a very cynic way uh, an architecture that was based on the circle of the fire engine. So you designed basically the whole urban plan on the fact that you make courtyards, and the courtyards had the size of the fire engine, and you put courtyards into courtyards just to house as many uh, people as possible. And that produced uh, quite uh, complicated uh, living circumstances for uh, the underclass, and resulted also in quite horrible uh, living conditions. So that was the way people used to live 100 years ago. Eh? So you had... Uh, I don't know, apartment of 45 uh, square meter, and in average they had five, six uh, children. Uh, life expectation was maybe 50, uh, and uh, it was obviously a very uh, complicated, complicated situation and the direct result of, uh, uh, let's say, capitalism. And the question was, when you worked as an architect in that time, you had somehow relate to it. But what was also really obvious that that was not really the model of the future. So guys like Tessano were all also looking, let's say, for a yeah, sort of alternative for that. And then the question is, where could you find these kind of alternatives? And I think, let's say, for the architects of this generation, I mean, they, they didn't look just on that surrounding, direct surrounding, but they looked also more back in, in history and look back also on more lucky moments of uh, 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 German history, especially the period before the Industrial Revolution. And uh, because in that period, somehow the, uh, the idea of the, the, the German nation was somehow uh, produced and you had a lot of uh, artists and poets who, who deal with that kind of uh, issues. And one of the guys who was dealing with it was uh, Kaspar David Friedrich, a guy who was, uh, let's say, born close to the place where Tessino was come from and also used to live in uh, Dresden uh, for a while. And, I mean, he expressed very much, let's say, somehow the, the uh, German soul, somehow, uh, in a way, because uh, his work was very much dealing with... Uh, uh, the landscape and the loneliness in the landscape, something that let's, I think what Germans like quite a lot, but also the, the uh, dangers of landscape, like in this building of the sunken uh, boat somewhere in the ice sea. And, um, but 
his paintings also represented somehow a sort of German dream, eh, in a way, very Protestant dream of the of the South, of the especially of the I mean, whenever the Germans had to choose between the Romans and the the, the Greek, they always decided for the Greek, <laughs> because the, the 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 Greek represented somehow. Uh, the very essence of uh, European uh, culture, and let's say, like expressed also in in in, in, in these paintings, and it, there was also always a German, uh, let's say, projection, a Protestant projection on Greek culture. For instance, the temples are always white, and <laughs> the Germans still have today problems with the fact that the temples originally were painted and looked quite horrible, but <laughs> let's say they had always this dream that was just very dry, very white, only construction, and so on. But so that, that, that was something what, what played, played a role. And the other thing was also this kind of, uh, let's say, Gothic uh, heritage, what is also, I think, uh, let, let's say, a typical thing in the north of the, of the Alps, that you always wonder where is this Gothic culture coming from. It has maybe something to do also with the, with the forest. And uh, that was also somehow in the in the in the things eh? and a certain way of let's say living a certain meaning of of the house a house as a protection against the uh, cold uh, climate and let's say regarding architecture it was also clear that let's say in the case of Tesano the architecture of the fin de siècle was not really something that could function as a model for the for the 21st century so he was also looking back on on history and when he was a student he really studied uh, let's say uh, architecture of rural areas and one of the things he particularly liked was the the garden house of uh, goethe built around i think 1810 in in uh, weimar with a very let's say dry uh, aesthetic and it was also obviously a link with, uh, let's say, Schinkel as, let's say, maybe the, the most important architect of the 19th century, who, let's say, tried in his work to, let's say, connect uh, architecture and landscape in a sort of interesting way. So we have always these kind of pergolas with the, with the green and double high spaces, but when you close your eyes, it looks also a little bit already like uh, Le Corbusier. A very rational approach towards uh, 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 architecture in the Bau Academy, where you can already imagine the first uh, skyscrapers in in Chicago when you look on the on on this building, or a certain way to make uh, let's say uh, public uh, buildings that celebrate somehow the fact that they are uh, public, and then. Let's say Tesano somehow started, and uh, he basically, uh, I think, for a long time worked more or less alone. That was at that time very normal, and uh, I mean that was a sketch he produced, and you see already a little bit, uh, let's say, what is important for him. Eh? So you see, there's this huge table where he can put all his stuff, and then he has his instruments, uh, and then a little dock as a sort of friendly. Comrade, and then a big window where you can have nice light from the left hand side. So it was obviously drawing with the right hand, and then a little uh, cactus for the winter time. And uh, for me, it's not so easy to, to, to come up with a very precise uh, message about Tesano because I just don't know. I'm not a researcher, I just read a couple of books, and that's it, huh? like, it like it works. But I found, let's say, quite a nice statement by uh, Giorgio Grassi, who was actually, a, or is actually a big fan of, of Tessineau, where he says that what he liked very much is that uh, he was looking back on the history of the uh, profession without illusions about the future. And I think that's quite uh, good. So he was looking back without becoming sentimental. And by that, uh, he avoided on one hand to being as radical as the as the modernist because he was somehow part of a tradition, but he also avoided to becoming nostalgic, and he made a sort of interesting mix between, let's say, being part of a tradition and trying to find out uh, something new. And I think as a sort of working method or as a sort of strategy, I think this is quite 
um, interesting and we liked it uh, very much. And when he started as a sort of young architect, um, there was not so much work. He, I have to say that he first uh, was educated as a sort of carpenter and then he studied for a couple of uh, semesters in, in Munich. And then he worked basically as a sort of teacher in the building school. And in the beginning he had not much work, but he was very much thinking about uh, uh, the condition of uh, housing. And the interesting thing is that he very often started from the, from the interior. So there were endless drawings of interiors like that. And it was also the typical way of his representation of architecture, because at that time there were no renderings or something like that. Huh? And uh, he also didn't work much with models. He always made these kind of, uh, let's say, very uh, precise uh, drawings. And I think they are somehow funny because all the elements you see are somehow of the same importance. So there's something on the table and something in the window. It was very much about creating a certain uh, atmosphere. And he could also, with love, let's say, design this kind of stables and so on with chicken. And let's say, as a German, you are very used to this kind of environment, and you are quite amazed about the beauty somehow uh, in it. Huh? And he also made this kind of, uh, let's say, proposes a grave in the in the forest. What let's say, where you can could say that he was, let's say, also dealing with this kind of Gothic uh, uh, tradition. It looks very northern in a way, huh? and. Yeah, he also did that, this kind of monumental staircase that remind a bit on, let's say, Roman architecture, but also on, on Schinkel. Yeah, but that was his sort of, that, that were his first exercise. And the funny thing about it, let's say, how he started was that he actually started not as a builder, but as a writer, because he was a teacher and he was writing stuff. And actually, he produced quite a lot of books. And I think the first publication he did was already in 1907. And I think he published in his whole career like uh, uh, five, six uh, books, and they were quite uh, influential in a way, maybe more influential uh, than the buildings he, he did. And then around uh, 1908 or something, he could really start uh, his career by getting involved in the first, uh, in the project for the first garden city in uh, uh, Germany, in Hellerau, close to Dresden, because they had a sort of, there was a factory, a furniture factory in the city, and they decided to move the, the factory out of the city and build a new uh, factory and build, let's say, around the factory, a sort of new uh, village. And the design of the, of the village was done by uh, uh, Rimo Schmidt, a sort of Art Nouveau uh, architect. And uh, Tessano uh, could slowly get more and more influence on the design uh, of the village. And let's say one of the first things he did was uh, a very simple project of two uh, uh, houses. And obviously it was very much also based on uh, um, a search for uh, economic uh, architecture and what he did what's quite funny is he designed two um, more or less uh, identical houses and connected them uh, with a little pavilion and um, as you see these houses look very much like the Goethe house in, in Weimar but I think just by the fact that you make uh, two of these houses uh, you can learn already quite a lot about uh, 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 architecture because when you mirror uh, things, the meaning uh, changes quite a lot because the focus is mo moving more to the middle or the relation between the, the uh, uh, two objects. And you can also see a little bit how he dealt with, uh, let's say, the detailing. So the, let's say the roof is very close, connected to the wall. The wall is very... Uh, smooth and there are only, let's say, interruptions by the, by the window, by the windows. And then there's a sort of interesting way how he deals with symmetry. So you have the symmetry of the thing and then also the blocks itself are symmetric, but 
the symmetry is not very uh, dominant. It's very, let's say, modest. And um, he was in his work quite a lot dealing with uh, uh, housing for the uh, lower income and try to find uh, alternatives for the apartment buildings in the in the urban blocks. So the idea was to uh, make it possible for the working class also to live in a more rural area with an own garden. And he was working quite a lot on uh, economic uh, solutions of how to build these type of houses. And in his career, he built, I think, maybe 20 of... Uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, project. And at the moment when he did it, around 1910, he was really on the, let's say, European avant-garde of doing something like that. Huh? And let's say uh, in his approach, it was very close to to uh, Adolf Loos, who did shortly before the end of the, of the uh, uh, First World War also experiments with very similar type of houses. And and here you see a bit uh, how that looked like. And you see an, an architecture that is already reduced nearly to uh, zero. Extremely uh, uh, confronting, where you wonder what it is because you see only a plastered facade. You see, let's say, uh, three windows, entrance door. And everything is only, let's say, connected by uh, uh, proportions. The separation of the houses is done by uh, uh, rainwater uh, pipes. And the only bit public element is this kind of stair made of bricks, where you could have a chat with the neighbor and could could put a bench. And that's it. That was, that was uh, possible, really. In, architecture stripped to the bone. And on the back side you see actually a yeah, similar facade. So stucco facade, bigger windows where the living rooms are, and then a little uh, 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 pergola. And that is the life that was, let's say, happening in this kind of houses. So you see the lady of the house maintaining a little garden where they could, could produce uh, vegetables for themselves. And actually he did quite a lot of, uh, let's say, this kind of project. There was also a lot of publications and you could really see that all the, the, the modernists somehow learned from his uh, approach. So there's an obvious link with uh, Bruno Taut and Ernst May, but there's also, it's quite funny when you look at uh, Le Corbusier version architecture. You could, can also see that that he was aware of the of this uh, position. And Tesno was in uh, Le Corbusier was uh, I think four times in in Hellerau, and uh, because his brother uh, lived there. And uh, when uh, Tesno got the commission to build a festival house, uh, he offered Le Corbusier the possibility to work with him together. But Le Corbusier wanted really to be the co-designer, and Tesno said, no, I will keep the <laughs> most important part for myself. And then uh, Le Corbusier uh, basically uh, quit. And uh, this was maybe the, uh, let's say, uh, or a very interesting moment in, in his career, because Tesno started as a sort of uh, guy who was actually very much interested in housing, but then he got, I think, in the age of 35, uh, uh, commission for a very important uh, uh, public building in the uh, uh, city of Hellerau. And it was for a new uh, theater. And there's actually an interesting thing with uh, Switzerland, because the guys who uh, founded the, the theater were Jacques Dacros and uh, Alphonse Appia, and they are both from uh, Geneva and uh, Lausanne. And in the plane I read that the first sketches were made actually in Lausanne for the, for, for, for the design. And what he did was he designed, let's say, the, 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 the theater, uh, the building with uh, some buildings around to have a, a piazza in front of the theater. 
and the theater was built on a little hill in, in Hellerau, so you see these surrounding houses, and then you see already the, the theater with the main uh, auditorium. And uh, what is really obvious when you look uh, at, at this work that here something really new is happening. The thing was opened, I think, in 1912. And you can really see that, uh, let's say, the fin de siècle is really over. Huh? So it's something com 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 completely different than the architecture at the end of the, of the uh, uh, 19th uh, century. And what, let's say, Tessano did was he designed a theater which was very much uh, based on the uh, function of the main auditorium. So he did he worked very close together with the with uh, Dicross and uh, Apia to find, let's say, the perfect answer for this new uh, uh, theater. And let's say design looks actually quite quite simple. You have a higher part in the middle and then the entrance portico on the front side, but also on the back side. You have the main auditorium as a sort of flexible space. And then you have, uh, let's say, two uh, foyer spaces and a couple of other halls um, all around. And so you see here a photograph of the, of the uh, piazza in, in front. And what you really see is that the architecture is at the end reduced to very few elements. Huh? So you have, again, sort of plastered facades, just some windows, some columns, and that's it. And everything is more or less held together by the, uh, by the proportions. So it was very much focusing on the, on the setup of the, of the thing. So there are a lot of proportional relations that is based on the square and, then, and so on just to, uh, let's say, uh, define a sort of logical system uh, for the construction of the, of the theater. And when you look into the inside, then you see that there is not so much to be seen. It's basically about uh, space and uh, uh, daylight and just a very few, uh, let's say, refined elements like the, like the stair and the handrails. There was not much money, so uh, you could also see that, let's say, the things he had to do, he used to give them really a sort of uh, meaning, like this cloud of lamps on the uh, ceiling. And the main focus in the in the building was the auditorium and that was quite revolutionary in the uh, time when it was built because it was just a simple uh, a box with a sort of slope for the audience and then this part was completely uh, flexible you could arrange the stage in different uh, configurations and let's say what they did was there was a sort of long discussion about the uh, uh, light system and what at the end they decided to make the entire uh, theater without daylight. They put canvas on all the walls and behind the canvas there were, was a special lighting system and by that they could regulate the light intensity inside the auditorium and that produced this kind of uh, views for the uh, audience and they were here let's say experimenting with uh, new forms of uh, uh, classical music in combination with uh, uh, gymnastics and uh, dance. Then the uh, First World War came and uh, there was not so much uh, work also, after the, the let's say, uh, war was finished, there was economic crisis. And in the 20s, uh, Tessino got uh, uh, several new uh, uh, commissions for public buildings. And one of the most interesting one is the uh, Landesschule in Klotsche, also close to 
Dresden, where, let's say, he together with an uh, other architect designed uh, the school building and then the dormitories for the, for the students and also a little uh, auditorium. And the interesting thing is that this kind of uh, school was built on basis of the pavilion uh, system let's say a typology that was maybe for the first time used by uh, Jefferson in the design for the University of uh, Virginia. And what uh, uh, Tessino did actually in a quite uh, similar way, he put all these kind of uh, dormitory buildings and connected them by a sort of uh, uh, pergola, which looked like that. So we had, uh, let's say, uh, uh, wooden, uh, a courtyard surrounded by uh, wooden columns and then with a little hill in the middle with, uh, with some trees. And for me, let's say, that was really, this building was also one of the, let's say, most shocking events in relation with architecture because when I was a student, I, was, I, had, I, I had the Tessano book and I was reading and then I discovered this building. I thought, oh, fuck, I really have to say that. I was jumping on my bicycle. I go there, and when I came, let's say the bulldozers were driving here <laughs> and knocking everything down, and only the, the little hill uh, remains. It was knocked down in the middle of the, unfortunately, in the middle of the 90s. And, but what was interesting that this pergola is connecting with the building at the, at the uh, backside. You see that a little bit better here. So you see the, the arcade, and then the arcade is becoming part of the, of the facade. And then the, let's say, the wooden columns become part of the structure of the surface, as you can see here. So you see the, the uh, stucco facade, a double high building with, again, let's say, very reduced elements, so just an entrance door, a stair, and then, let's say, windows according to a certain proportional system. And then he added just very, just I, I would say, 20 centimeter in front of the facade, these kind of columns that are connected with the roof. And by that, I think the, 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 the architecture looks just a little bit more uh, uh, monumental, a little bit more public and also more uh, friendly somehow. And I like that quite a lot. So we see also a little bit the, the, the shadow and uh, and it was, I think, also a sort of a theme that would, was, let's say, in the in the 80s, used by a lot of other uh, architects, like, uh, for instance, Monet, uh, who they, they were quite aware of that work. It really, at a certain moment, it was rediscovered. And what Tessano also quite often did was exhibition design. I just want to show you one thing that was for an art exhibition in Dresden. What I like quite a lot, where he did a courtyard with a sort of wooden grid open, and then he put these plants and he did in a sort of uh, shingle manner, a sort of, let's say, a green space where you don't know exactly anymore, is it outside, is it inside, which fits quite well to, to let's say, the dream we always have in the north of the south. Uh, so when you <laughs> imagine <laughs> Greece or these kind of places, then you always think on that and that thing that's for, for a temporary thing that's working quite well in, in, the, in the German uh, context. Another thing he designed was a school in uh, uh, Kassel. I was there two years ago, but I'm not really, actually here I'm not really a, a big fan. I can also explain you why. I mean, what he did was that he designed a sort of quite perfect block with a, with a courtyard in the middle, with a sort of main uh, entrance zone. But then he did a little bit like a sort of functionalistic design by adding boxes to, to the main uh, uh, building. And I mean, the, the, the quality of that is that you can keep these buildings really clean. So you see, okay, you have here an auditorium and you have the main entrance. But on the other hand, I think the, the meaning of the, of the whole geometry as such is, was for me not so clear when I was there, at least what I saw. And I think the problem is also a little bit with these kind of buildings. Now they extended also a bit here, 
because I think, let's say, the, the, the good uh, thing about what you can also understand about symmetry and classicism and so on is that this is, for the users, a very, very convincing way to make architecture because they understand when you make a symmetrical buildings, then they understand, okay, uh, it's a bit stupid to change the building on the left-hand side because when we change on the left side, we have also to change on the right side because the symmetry is something that is very easy to understand. But when you make, a, let's say, functionalistic uh, a building where you start to add boxes, then composition is very often not so clearly to understand and it's very easy to say, okay, we can go on. Eh? You just, like, like in the in the Picasso collage, eh? when you would ask normal people from the street, they could also imagine to glue something in eh? because they just don't know when to stop. Eh? <laughs> and I think that, let's say, that would be my little critique on, on this design. But for the rest, I mean, it was also quite typical for, for Tessano. So you see here the, 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 the wing with the, with, the, with the sport hall. And then you see here the, the main uh, school building with the, with the uh, glass rooms. Again, uh, let's say, stucco facade and then big windows and all the windows more or less uh, the same, very uh, reduced, only the corners are a little bit uh, emphasized. And then you have the, the auditorium as a space, also quite nice with a, let's say, a little bit yeah. lifted podium and then uh, windows on two sides, what is actually very uh, friendly, and the courtyard of the school in the middle with basically corridors all around. And um, at the end of the, of the uh, 20s, he designed together with uh, uh, an uh, architect from the from the local government, the a swimming pool in Berlin. And I think it was maybe his uh, most important contribution, f let's say, for the realization of a really public uh, uh, facility in a big city. And what I like very much is that you can, I mean, I don't know exactly what his intention were, but that you have to bit the idea that he tried to design the the, the swimming pool in a way that you have a lot of daylight, that you have nearly the feeling that you could swim outside. It's really in the in the in in, in Mitte in Berlin, really in a very dense urban area, but you have this very nice uh, filtered light with a super nice uh, glass ceiling, and yeah, it's really stripped to the to the essence. So you have only a walk zone all around, and then. A uh, very nice uh, Olympic pool, 50 meters, and, and yeah, yeah, you don't have this, this all the stuff what you have nowadays with this kind of stupid spirals and so on. No, it's just about swimming, just very, very dry with these nice uh, towers, tower to jump into the into the uh, water, and the swimming pool is. Uh, still in good shape and I think uh, it's worth for all of you when you are next time in Berlin to have a swim in the in the swimming pool because I think it's quite nice to let's say have this space of light and this kind of very nice coverage to see this kind of cover of the of the sky and one of the last really important buildings he did was the transformation of the Neue Wache in Berlin and I think that's actually uh, my personal, uh, uh, my, my favorite one of Tessino, because uh, what I like here very much is that, uh, let's say, I think transformation is a very um, difficult job uh, for an architect, maybe even more difficult than to build a new uh, building. And what he did was in a very, let's say, Palladio-like manner, that he just tried to strengthen the qualities of the, uh, of the building, but tried to add that that was missing. And uh, the interesting thing about the design of Schinkel, the building was designed uh, by Schinkel in, I think, 1824 or something, or 26. And uh, what, the, what the problem of the building by Schinkel was that it looked from the outside uh, very strong, but from the inside, the floor plan was very functionalistic. So there was no big hall or something. So it was just a house for the guard of the king. And there was not really an interior. Huh? So, the building was from the outside very ambitious, but from the inside it was rather uh, pragmatic. And um, uh, Tessano was invited to, uh, in, I think, 1930, to, for a competition to 
uh, transform the building into a sort of war memorial for the victims of the First World War. And the entire uh, German avant-garde was invited. So there's also a design by Miss von Rohe and a design by Pölzig and so on. But uh, Tessino won. And I think he had a very, uh, let's say, nice idea because he said, yeah, okay, we, have, we keep this building and we basically try to realize within this structure the biggest space uh, as uh, uh, possible. So it means you enter and then it's exactly that happening what you would expect. You enter and there's one big, uh, big space. And this space is in a very clear dialogue with the expression of the outside. And what he did was they changed the, the, the structure and brought in a new uh, steel construction for the roof with a, a big uh, skylight. I think the diameter is, I should know, I think four meter or something. And by that, let's say it was also a sort of uh, reinterpretation fitting also to the uh, uh, attitude of Schinkel because he did a design that looked or reminded also a little bit on the uh, Pantheon in, in Rome. And looks also a bit, little bit like as if Schinkel, let's say, would uh, redesign his own buildings 100 years uh, later. So it is also somehow uh, quite uh, modest. And the funny thing for me was here that uh, um, Tesano in his entire career always had to work with very, let's say, bad budgets. It was always about economy of means, saving and so on. And here maybe for the first time he got really a, a, a commission where money didn't play a big uh, role. But, and, so he, and so he could do something that was very refined. So he used uh, 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 granite for the, for the block in the middle and I think limestone uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the walls. But he used the materials in a way that he didn't show off so much. He didn't want it to show that these are expensive materials. He just did it in a very uh, proper uh, way and was, again, mainly focusing on the uh, uh, proportions. And you can see a little bit the scale of these buildings, of, of the, of the uh, photos from the building uh, process, where you see that this block in the middle was like, I think, one meter seventy or something, and it was a very, let's say, modest uh, gesture, and and it was also very difficult in that time to build this monument because always the fascists were always uh, getting more and more power, and there were a lot of attacks on Tessineo on the as well from the left hand side, but also from the right wing, and after he finished the the, the stuff, he was actually completely fucked up because it was really got uh, at strife with a lot of people also because of the of the competition it was quite uh, uh, frustrated but i think let's say when you see the result you don't have the intention or the the, the impression that uh, he had to make a lot of compromises uh, then uh, the uh, uh, fascists uh, came into uh, uh, power and uh, Tesno was quite uh, frustrated about that because uh, uh, he was not really a particular fan of the, of the Anastasia Pay. And I think in the perception of uh, um, Tesno, there was for a very long time the problem that some of his uh, students became very much uh, involved with the uh, uh, Nazis. And Let's say his assistant uh, was Albert Speer, who became basically the most important uh, uh, architect of Hitler. And let's say he transformed uh, the <coughs> Tessinos architecture into uh, something that was much more uh, monumental and, and heavy, and also something that was much more meant to impress. Huh? And that was, I think, not the main intention of, uh, of, uh, of Tessino. And you can, let's say, when you look on several of, of the projects of Speer, you can still see that there is a, obviously a link with uh, uh, Tessino, but you see also that, let's say, 
uh, let's say some things are completely different and I mean during the whole uh, 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 30s Tesno was actually somehow in the lucky position that he could at least still teach at the university in Berlin so he was professor but he was not really uh, engaged he had hardly any uh, uh, commissions in that time and I think one of the a few projects that I really tried was the famous competition in uh, uh, Prora for the uh, KDF uh, holiday um, resort on the island of Rügen on the basis of an invitation by, by Speer where he tried an architecture that yeah, looked typical Tesno like where he designed this kind of hall here. I had just a bad photograph, but what is actually a very a lot of also an example a hall with uh, I think a thousand of very slender columns. What was again I think in the 70s and 80s an item. There were a lot of Spanish architects tried to build that. Philip Johnson built a house like that, and I think even the new stadium of uh, Herzog de Moron in Bordeaux is let's say very much influenced by this kind of uh, design. And in the inside of this hall, he tries somehow to engage with the, with the, with the, with the, with the Nazis. But yeah, at the end, it also didn't happen. And then, uh, I mean, after the war, he did some plans for rebuilding several German cities, and he died in the 50s. But at the end, it was quite sad because I think the last 15 years of his life, he could hardly build uh, anything. Okay. Uh, so then we are 100 years later. Eh? <laughs> so now, now we come to. <laughs> now, now I will talk a little bit about Atelier Capital, but I will mainly talk that in let's say, relation to Tesano. Eh? But what you, what you see already is that the conditions of architecture change a lot because the pen doesn't play an important role. Eh? So everybody is sitting behind a computer and you don't work alone anymore. Eh? I mean, it's always amazing that, I mean, Guys like uh, Tesano or even Le Corbusier they did enormous public buildings with very, very few employees. The office were always very uh, small. And nowadays, the thing became so complicated that you need a lot of people to get uh, the work uh, uh, done. And in our case, the, the office is founded by André Kemper and me in... in, in uh, uh, 2000, our background, our German background, uh, let's say, plays in the, the, in the work of the office an important uh, role. And let's say we are quite aware, especially because of the fact that we live in the Netherlands. So we, we let's say, changed country and by that we also recognize that we became more Germans than we maybe would have been in Germany. Well, it's very logical. That's a bit like uh, you come because you become more aware of, of, uh, of, the, of, your, of your own roots. And I think in our childhood, I think what was actually uh, quite uh, uh, dominant was the fact that we grow up in the East, yeah, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, in a sort of communist system, but the, the system was actually already completely fucked up. Nobody really believed in it anymore. And we were very much, uh, let's say, frustrated because we had always the idea that somehow the ideas were not bad, eh? sort of you could see uh, communism as an extension of uh, Christianity somehow. Eh? But, uh, uh, but in the, in, at the end it didn't really work out. Eh? But at the same time, and that's, quite, that's a quite typical thing that we also, let's say, we are frustrated of the West because you could see that the whole idea of the welfare state was basically skipped in the, at, the end of the, at the end of the 70s. And I think from the 80s on, there was only this kind of neoliberal policy with the aim to uh, reduce taxes like hell, not invest in the public sector anymore, and so on. Eh? Actually, a very bad basis for, for architecture, because architecture is a sort of public uh, thing. Eh? And if you don't, let's say, pay taxes and you don't invest in the public uh, sector, then there's no architecture anymore. Because, I mean, when you do, when you base an architecture only of villas, and I think it's a sad uh, uh, profession. So for us, it was always a bit difficult to, let's say, relate. And like typical for, for our generation, we basically focused a lot on music when we were younger, yeah? like the Sex Pistols, because we thought, okay, there's something like this kind of frustration that could also form a basis for, 
for, uh, 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 let's say, our existence or to find uh, your way. And I mean, there are, let's say, I mean, we share the same, uh, uh, let's say, fascination for, let's say, a lot of this kind of music from the, especially from the from the 80s. And the funny thing is that there is also a sort of uh, strange relation with German culture, especially related to this photograph, because the photo of the photograph of Sonic Youth. And then the first time that I got in touch with uh, Gerhard Richter was on basis on the cover of the Sonic Youth. <laughs> and then you have again something what, what is interesting that this kind of, let's say, you need a basis to start. Huh? And for us, let's say, also contemporary art uh, was a sort of interesting. Uh, uh, starting point of our work because it can also help, can also help to find your uh, identity and especially the link with Richter and Caswell uh, David uh, Friedrich is also again interesting because uh, you see again the same uh, fascination for uh, the landscape in a more let's say uh, modern uh, let's say version you see again, a sort of fascination for the Gothic forest in combination with two Fiats driving along with uh, 80 kilometers per hour. And uh, you see also this kind of, uh, let's say, taking distance to the political uh, uh, conditions, especially of the 70s, like in this portrait of uh, Gudrun Enslin from the RIF. And I think the RIF was the a uh, left-wing terrorist organization in Germany very much showed this kind of tension within uh, uh, German society after uh, Second World War. But you see also interesting way of dealing with architecture, like in um, the building of uh, the uh, main piazza in Milan, where you see that the architecture of the 19th century somehow is there, but also starts to disappear or even in a tougher way in the in the uh, painting for the uh, Domo in, in Milano, where let's say the let's say the, the Gothic uh, is even more emphasized by bringing in all this kind of vertical line, but also the let's say what, what we like quite a lot is that the 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 architecture is uh, there, but also is disappearing, and I think that's also a little bit I think a sort of condition where we have to deal with, in, in, let's say, in our professions where we do something, where we have to deal with the past. We, we do something that reminds on the past, but at the same time, we, we know that, uh, let's say, things getting rougher, uh, simpler, and we are on the edge that just architecture uh, is not there anymore. It's only a pragmatic thing. And I think in the, in the work of Richter, this kind of aspect that things disappear are really, let's say, an interesting theme. And from our point of view, he's very much dealing with this kind of classical tradition and the fact that you can try to, let's say, create it just for a moment. Yeah, you bring it back, but then it's slowly disappearing because it's somehow also impossible at the, at the same time. And let's say because of the fact that we grow up in the in, in, in the East, uh, for us, uh, we had always a very complicated relation with uh, postmodernistic architecture when we, when we were students that everybody was enthusiastic about Aldo Rossi and Sterling and Hans Hollein and, and so on. And let's say we had simply, because of the fact that we were coming from the East, we just simply couldn't understand huh? because we were from a cultural point not prepared for the situation. So, so I went to the library and was reading books of Hannes Meyer, Kropius, <laughs> this kind of guy because <laughs> let's say this, this kind of attitude was much more fitting to this, let's say, communist context where we had been growing up, grown up. Huh? And for us, let's say Mies was somehow an interesting, uh, 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 let's say, discovery. And uh, we were always, let's say, all, we are still very much uh, fascinated by, by, by his works because uh, there's, let's say, on one hand, a very interesting relation between, in that case, real estate development and architecture. Huh? So you don't know. Eh? When you look on it, you, it's, I mean, one of the 
let's say, few moments in, uh, in, in, in architecture history in the Western world where real estate development and architecture were extremely close because, let's say, this building was at the time when it was built could really, uh, let's say, uh, was from an economic point of view uh, really feasible. But at the same time, it was also a top architecture, but it's not very often the case because, because very often top architecture is, yeah, you have much more economic means. But in that case, that was not the case. And it was also dealing with the, the classical uh, uh, history, like I mean, I showed already the design of the Altes Museum, and you see that uh, uh, Mies, let's say, was part of a tradition, but turned also this kind of stuff into something else. And you see also several uh, uh, themes uh, also from uh, other architects coming back, because when you look on that and then you think back on the swimming pool of Tessano, then you see that it's not so different in a way, that you just, uh, yeah, you have a certain way of expression of the ceiling and of the wall. So there are interesting uh, uh, relations. And in our case, I mean, the, the, the uh, um, economy of means uh, was always the starting point because we, let's say, already from the beginning realized that when you work in Holland and you want to build something, then it's very much about conceptualizing uh, uh, the cheapness. Uh, so we have to deal with this kind of uh, uh, issue. But we also thought that it is important to, let's say, make a link somehow with the, with the past. And let's say the reason we, why we went to the Netherlands had a lot to do with our, with our past because we had been grown up in, in the, in the uh, 70s and 80s and our, let's say, childhood very often happened in this kind of uh, uh, panel housing. And for us, it was always really interesting as kids because, uh, let's say, when you, when you think about communist ideology, then there was not so much, let's say, what could represent a reality the new future. And one of the things that represented somehow the future were this kind of housing estates. So they were meant to produce a new world, but in reality they were, let's say, rather uh, frustrating. But at the same time, you could also see that they were done with, with uh, love somehow, huh? because the people just tried to do what was possible at that, at that moment. And, and, and for us, it was an interesting thing that in the 90s in Holland, there was still this kind of big, big scale housing projects. And we thought, OK, that was, was interesting, because in the other European countries, housing was at that uh, uh, moment not really uh, an issue. And we thought it could be interesting to go to a place just to work on housing, because we thought housing is uh, a very um, important thing, because you define uh, living conditions and you create somehow also uh, cities of the future. And when we started the office in the first years, we were very much focusing on uh, designs for uh, mainly uh, uh, public or collective housing. And I mean, in, in opposition to, to Tesano, we are very much, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in favor of very compact urban housing. So you, let's say why Tesno was very much against uh, the big cities and proposed living on the periphery. Let's say we come from a generation where, let's say, a lot of people worked on the, uh, used to live on the periphery, and we think it's very much important to work on, on uh, let's say, uh, compact forms of housing that are still, let's say, of high uh, uh, quality. And one of the first things we let's say, on we, where we worked on was the European uh, proposal for uh, Rotterdam in uh, 2000, and where we tried to, let's say, combine in, 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 in the apartments the urban condition and, let's say, the condition of artificial nature. And it's interesting to compare it to the interiors of Tessano, because while Tessano was really focusing on the refinement of the interior, uh, let's say, for why we from our, let's say, contemporary experience say, okay, the interior is not really an issue. The only thing what is important in housing within our, let's say, economic conditions is the relation between inside and outside, because we don't know anymore how people live. And uh, there is also not really a thing as the nuclear family or something. 
anymore. Eh? So people live in a very different ways. There are people that want to live in lofts, others want to live in, in more conventional housing. And for us, uh, housing is very much about defining a sort of a frame. And in this frame, a lot of things uh, 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 can happen. And for us, it would be, let's say, our let's say, favorite uh, project would be uh, just to make an, an, a building. And the building could be used for small units or big units, but could be used at the same time for offices. So that was actually, I mean, when you compare that to, to Tessano, then you can see that, let's say, a lot of these uh, uh, conditions regarding housing uh, have changed in the last hundred years. And we also uh, started somehow, what was actually funny, in, in a similar way that we, before we uh, start to build, we were writing stuff uh, about housing. And that helped, in a way, to get the first uh, commission for uh, uh, social housing. It was actually the, the first social housing building project we built in south of the Netherlands. Typical thing, raw houses, uh, and where we, yeah, let's say, stripped the, the possibilities of the, the Dutch raw house to its essence by uh, bringing in the sort of zone for living and the zone for service. And the zone for living is, let's say, completely of glass, and the service zone is completely uh, uh, closed would look like uh, that. And uh, after that, we built, let's say, quite a lot of uh, different uh, uh, housing projects. And this is, let's say, the maybe the most uh, uh, known uh, low rise uh, housing uh, projects where we tried to find a sort of innovative solution for the parking and by that developed an interesting way to organize the, the, the living room. But you see, in a, now you could say in a very contemporary version of, of Tesano, the, the, the building is stripped to its essence. So we have the, the construction, the entrance door, and then a very deep plan and the facade with brings uh, basically uh, light into the interior. <coughs> and you see here also a sort of uh, way how people uh, use the, the apartments with a lot of green in front and some furniture. And, uh, and we try to avoid the, we are not really a fan of these kind of stucco uh, uh, facades. Uh, and the the question is what kind of alternatives you have in, in, in housing. And what we, let's say, for the first time did here is something what we called uh, economical uh, collage. It's a certain uh, strategy where we just, let's say, using different materials according to their functions. So we have uh, aluminum windows at the front, uh, steel plates on the side facade, wooden windows on the back side. But then we don't emphasize the facade, but we paint, in that case, everything white. And by that, you still get a little bit of sort of monolithic uh, character, while the materials are all uh, very different in chosen according to the budget. And do you see the, the backside of the, of the housing project? So you have street for uh, parking and then terraces on top of the, of the parking street. And also very, uh, let's say, also similar to Tesano, very reduced uh, uh, elements. And just to, let's say, explain you one thing to, I mean, let's say, to how tough the, the conditions of, of housing are is, let's say, uh, it's important to make this kind of separation between the uh, terraces. But in a normal Dutch uh, project for uh, raw houses, they are never in the budget. So it's always like you build the, the block and then people go to the building market to buy these kind of wooden things and put it. Huh? But in our case, yeah, let's say we had the terraces on the first floor, so we had to invent something. And then, okay, when you look back on history of modern architecture, there are super nice examples of how to make these kind of screens. So you can do uh, Elwood, Greg Elwood uh, design with, let's say, sanded uh, glass and very elegant. But in that project, it was never ever possible. At the end, we choose a foil. Huh? 
plastic foil, <laughs> cost uh, 180 euro for six meter by uh, two meter 40. But what we didn't uh, uh, tell the client where the foil was coming from because the foil was used to separate pigs in uh, stables. And, but this is, let's say, the this is a bit the the let's say the condition of uh, con contemporary housing in a lot of uh, European uh, uh, countries. <coughs> then you see some, let's say, maybe the most amazing space, the the, the parking garage, and some of the uh, interiors. And another thing that's maybe also a little bit uh, related to to uh, to Tessano is a, a project we did for an uh, um, apartment tower in the north of uh, Amsterdam, where we let's say uh, made a block basically consisting out of one uh, window type, and we offered a quite rigid uh, structure that on one hand reminds a little bit on, on uh, uh, guys like Oswald Matthias Unger, so you have a block with a sort of dominant entrance, very quiet, but at the same time mm, has also a little bit more informal attitude because of the fact that the facade is glass. You know, people can, let's say, form with their interiors part of the expression of the building itself. And uh, the building can also change during winter and summer because we have winter gardens behind the facade. And when you come in summer, then the facade is mostly uh, open, while in the winter the building looks more uh, hermetic. And the, like as in the case of Tessano, the the organization of the uh, apartments is very straightforward. So it's very, let's say, intelligent use of the uh, construction. Everything is stripped to its uh, essence, but we also, uh, like Tesno, tried to work a lot with uh, daylight, so we put in an atrium into the building, and by that you get, uh, let's say, at the darkest point of the apartment, still daylight, and you have a quite an unexpected space in the middle. And let's say when when looking at the photos, you can also see a little bit the the uh, again the, the the link with the minimalistic attitude of Tessano. Huh? I always say that this space looks a bit like a combination of basement and Swiss uh, art museum. And uh, the, uh, well, what you see is that uh, yeah, you, you have not much elements to, to design this kind of spaces. Huh? So at the end you have just a simple wooden door, you paint it in the color. We had to even to keep the, the concrete in situ. It's not in situ concrete, it's just rough uh, construction, a concrete, and then we put a little bit of uh, coating on it, uh, uh, balustrade with, uh, with um, yeah, rough, and then again only the lamps are a sort of design issue, like in the in the festival house. So very. Uh, uh, let's say limited set of means, and we don't do that because we particularly like that. But it's let's say there is not much more what can be done with these uh, budgets. And then the uh, the interiors much more in dialogue with the uh, with the outside, and there is not really a particular let's say uh, interest in furniture. So we have also no control about that, but, but I think, let's say, as long as the space is big enough, an IKEA bench can look uh, quite okay. Yeah? And uh, at the moment we're building a, a housing project in Paris, and I just showed that because at the beginning I showed these two uh, Goethe houses by Tessano. We put more or less two similar buildings, and by that focusing on the space in between, we do at the moment something what is a little bit similar in, in, in Paris. So we built two more or less uh, similar blocks with a collective entrance zone in the middle. So you go first into a garden, and then from the garden you go into these two buildings. looks like that. So you go here in, and then you have the entrance hall. Unfortunately, we had to do one of these blocks like this, because this, 
these are the <laughs> very intelligent uh, urban planners who <laughs> invent uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, you see a bit, let's say, the, the things on the way. And let's say we have, yeah, in, in, in that way, it was very much about, let's say, discussion what is a sort of outside space in the city. Land, uh, like Paris, and what we do is here we do a sort of uh, double layered facade with a balcony all around, and we have a sort of winter garden where you have a sort of uh, mini loft like uh, apartment where you in winter can close off uh, the the entire facade with a double skin, and in summer you can just open it open it up and then I thought, yeah, okay, what is maybe also interesting is talk a little bit about uh, uh, public building. And we started actually in the beginning, like Tessano, also with temporary uh, public uh, structures. And I choose to show that one because I thought it was something that also reminds a little bit on, on the stuff we have seen from uh, uh, Tessano. But also reminds a little bit on Schindler because we got in 2003 the commission for the Dutch pavilion on the German International Garden uh, exhibition, and then we thought uh, it was the interesting. We had clients who wanted to please the Germans. Huh? It was very important. They said, "Yeah, we have to, we have to make good impressions. <laughs> they should like us." Huh? And uh, so they wanted to have something let's say, for the audience, but we thought also it should, it should be something that should express Holland and also should express the industrial nature of agricultural production, huh? like the typical Dutch tomato huh? with a lot of water in it. And then uh, we came along uh, this product, sort of invented by a, a Dutch company, that's a very Dutch project, product in a way for people that cannot wait, let's say, uh, till the garden is green, because you know you buy a hectic, you buy a house, and then I don't know five, six, seven years later, you just decide to resell and buy something else. So you have to have an instant garden. And there was a guy who invented this kind of instant uh, hedge, and he thought, oh wow, that's really nice, because it's on one hand it's really romantic, huh? but on the other hand it's also very industrial, and that's especially what we like also about Holland, huh? that you have on one hand this kind of bit romantic. Uh, aspect of living in an artificial garden, but at the same time, the, the, the whole country is ruled by uh, technology. So we designed a very simple uh, uh, pavilion of steel, steel, steel structure, and then did some monumental doors, and then we filled the whole structure with these uh, hedges. And by that we, uh, let's say, was a sort of play between, on one hand, this kind of German romantic, but on the other hand, also a sort of uh, army-like uh, expression. It was actually at the moment when the Second Iraq War started. It fitted quite well, I think. And the interior was, uh, I think, mm, let's say, I think the most interesting part because it was a bit what you saw already by Tessano, but also by Schinkel. It, uh, it was obviously an interior space, but at the same time, it was obviously also an outside uh, space. And then in 2004, we won a, a competition for a concert hall in a little village in, in Austria. And that was a project very often, very often uh, talked about Tessano, just because of the fact that in Hellerau, these kind of theaters also standing a bit in the periphery between a lot of these smaller houses. And yeah, I even tried to convince the, the client to call it Franz Liszt Festspielhaus, but at the end he didn't do it. But I, I always thought it would be really, would be really nice to. And what we what we did here was, uh, you see it already here implemented. So we had, a, let's say, close to the Hungarian border, a hilly landscape, with this typical, uh, let's say, one-story high, one-family houses and a wide church, and we designed uh, a theater would look a bit like, uh, uh, from the distance, a bit like an industrial hall, because there was, like so often, very little uh, budget, so we had to find really a sort of straightforward uh, solution. 
And the interesting thing was that the concert hall is normally a thing that you would build in a city. Yeah? It's a sort of typical bourgeois typology coming from the 19th century related to the expression of public space, and you don't build it in a in the village. And the reason why they built it was the fact that Franz Liszt was born in this house. And with European subsidies, they could manage to organize the budget to build there this uh, theater, what is used for festivals. And the interesting thing was that this building has not really a front side, because it's in the garden and there's not a lot of space, and people come from here and from there. So we did the building a bit like a, a pavilion, try to design it in a way that it looks as small uh, as possible to fit into the into the uh, uh, village, and let's say what we did, we did a foyer all around. We put like there's a no, let's say the hall in the in the middle, and this time we had to, we, we thought okay we have to we, we did when we did the competition an analysis of the economical circumstances and we found out okay natural stone forget it. We have to find really a sort of cheap material for the facade. And then we said, OK, maybe the, we cannot avoid the typical uh, uh, outside insulation that is typical for, let's say, this part of Austria. It's the cheapest way, basically. You make a concrete wall, and then you put uh, outside insulation with stucco. But we said, yeah, maybe we should avoid the stucco. And we proposed in the competition to use a sort of polyurethane coating for the facade. And by that, let's say, we could reduce all these typical edge, strange edge details. So the facade is basically one continuous uh, membrane. And then we put uh, some bigger windows in the, uh, in the walls. So we have a sort of wall functioning as a beam, and then you have big windows connecting inside uh, with the outside. And uh, we worked with uh, fixed uh, glazing. And in, that, in, in, in this project, we didn't use uh, glass, but we could use acrylic as, uh, as uh, uh, facade material. And by that, we could make uh, windows of 4 meters by 18 meters long out of one uh, piece. And then we put these kind of stable doors to have a sort of, let's say, relation between outside and inside. And we like, especially this photograph, so you see here, this is the fixed glazing, and this is the door open. And it looked very, let's say, um, normal in a way, yeah? sort of very quiet. We were quite happy with that. Do you see a little bit the setup of the things, the relation with the house of birth. And then we had the interior. And the interior was, let's say, that it's quite typical for our way of working that we, um, let's say, when we, when we, when we worked on the, on the concert hall, we asked ourselves, OK, what is actually the concert hall? And what is the history of this typology? And then we found out, OK, because we are not so familiar with the history, OK, it's coming basically from the church and was a sort of alternative for sort of religion in the 19th century. And the funny thing is that in the 19th, in the concert hall of the 19th century, there's a very close relation between the expression of the architecture and the sound of the building. So when you go to, for instance, the concert hall in, in Vienna, Musikverein, then that what you see is somehow the basis for that what you hear. And in the 20th century, that was uh, separated. So you have the Sharon making a big free shape but the acoustic is organized in a different way. So it's not really the same anymore. And we didn't like that so much because as a sort of, let's say, uh, when you work a bit with a sort of minimalistic tendency, then you really want that, that what you do is, let's say, can be used for different things. There's also a sort of question of uh, economy. So we, we decided basically to uh, design a concert hall that was based on the principles of the 19th uh, century concert halls, where it was quite, uh, uh, interesting, and <clears throat> and uh, say we're talking quite a lot about the, the material, and then at a certain moment we decided for wood because of the fact that there is a sort of relation between the length of the tone. And the acoustic engineer said, "Yeah, you have every three meter, you have to make a sort of interruption." 
Uh, and then we thought, okay, when you use wood, you have a sort of logical size of maximum uh, wooden elements. The maximum wooden elements in, in, in this kind of cross-laminated uh, timber you get by 350 by 280. And then we thought, okay, when we use cross-laminated timber, we could, uh, let's say, we have a sort of measure that would immediately create good basis for the, for the acoustics. And... Let's say the funny thing is that there is, when you look on the uh, swimming pool of Tessino, but also on Mies, that there is a sort of, yeah, you have this kind of grid, and there is a sort of weird relation between these, uh, these projects. And then I would like to show two projects where we're working at the moment. One is the, the German-Dutch uh, embassy in, in Morocco, where we have very, let's say, complicated uh, conditions because for uh, security uh, reasons what actually we yeah, are produces a building with a lot of walls and uh, separations and we basically work on the because you have two entrances and first you think okay this is the Dutch entrance this is the German entrance but it's not the case eh? because it's working differently so you have the entrance to the embassy, and this is the entrance to the consular section, and what we actually try to do is, it's, and that's a big revolution by in building an embassy, is trying to treat the entrance for the consular section the same way as the entrance for the embassy. Because I think it's really strange when you do an embassy that the, the main, and normally the main entrance is very representative, and there are very few people enter, and the consular section, the entrance is always somewhere from the backside. Huh? So we try to organize in a way that we have two entrances, and that let's say, produces a sort of certain organization inside the building. And the problem is that we have a big, let's say, green park, but people that are, let's say, work in the embassy are not allowed to, allowed to use the park because for security reasons. So, so what we do is we design, we have, let's say, a zone of parks all around, and they are basically for looking. And then we design one green space in the middle of the embassy that the people can can really use. So you get a sort of strange, very super compact uh, floor plan with the consular section and the, the embassy. And then on top, we have a ring of offices, all orientated towards the inside with a closed wall for security reasons. And this is producing a sort of somehow strange building, what is a little bit a mix of, on one hand, Arab, uh, Building tradition, but then you also, on the, but also on the other hand, reminds a bit on Los Angeles because climate is very similar. So trying to bring in a certain modernity into Morocco, and then you get, let's say, this kind of situation is the entrance situation, with zone for parking the cars. There's everywhere these gardens, and then you have a few car, a few from the main foyer into the the garden, and then on the top you have. Let's say on the first floor you have a big garden with a walkway and it produces a sort of, I think, 120 meter long space in the middle with all the offices around that space. And again, this you could say that has also a little bit to do with, let's say, let's say the subtropical uh, version of the Kloche School in uh, Dresden. And the last thing I would like to show is, um, is a school that we're working at the moment on. And that's actually a bit the, the, the opposition to, to the school by Tessino because it's not based on a, a, a campus concept, but, but on the idea to make the school as compact as possible. It's a school where uh, people get... Uh, uh, are uh, educated for, let's say, professions like uh, bricklayer and so on. So you have a huge uh, factory hall, and then on top of the factory hall we have a school building for with the with the classrooms, and and in the middle we have a, a huge uh, uh, atrium, and the floor plans are organized in a way. The building is I think hundred. 90 meters by 150 or something like that. It's quite, quite big with two entrances and then you have two factory halls and then the main school and on the top you have uh, 
not in atrium in the middle, but also partly filled and then with glass rooms on all sides. And that produces yeah, this kind of images. So you have the school rooms and the factory hall. And then we have the main auditorium and the atrium in the in the middle with the with the glass rooms. <coughs> And let's say first ideas for the outside. So there's a huge industrial building next to it. And we try to have a certain spatial connection between both of them. When we add, no, just don't know. We're just working on it at the moment. And let's say to to finish my my speech. Um, I think what was interesting for me was let's say to to see that. Um, Let's say on one hand the, the conditions of the, the profession changed a lot, huh? but on the other hand, when you let's say have a closer look, that you see that a lot of things uh, stayed somehow uh, the same. I mean, we notice okay, we are now much more rich than maybe uh, hundred years before, but still, I mean, we have to uh, let's say spend the money in a very careful uh, way and in that way you see that the let's say the approach of Tessano can still be seen as a sort of example of how to do uh, architecture even in the in the 21st uh, century and um, <coughs> what I like very much is the um, uh, the issue how Tessano dealt with the uh, public building because public building for him was a sort of very serious thing it was not about uh, joking around making strange shapes and so on but it was very much designing the, the the public building on basis of the wishes of the users even to be designed the theater even together with the users just to try to see the building as itself as a sort of experiment as a part of a sort of experimental approach and uh, in the the way he designed he focused very much on the public elements this is something that is very often uh, forgotten so I mean the most the, the, the biggest focus was the the, the the auditorium it was really clear huh? but then you have this kind of entrance and you have the two foyers they look nice and that's it huh? and I think that's also something what is really uh, what we appreciate very much huh? that this is uh, Say we really designed the public building for people to be inside and enjoy the space and enjoy the play. And um, nowadays, I wonder very often when you really go to the Gary Museum, you see certain shapes and the face might look interesting, but then you are inside and you don't know what you see. You cannot look at the art. And I think I think it's really important to think about. The relation between program and uh, architecture, not in a functionalistic way, but in a way that the architecture itself can form a sort of frame that is stimulating uh, a sort of inspired use of the space. And yeah, then there is this kind of link between landscape and uh, and architecture. I think this is a very nice. Uh, uh, theme. Unfortunately, we don't have so much space anymore, like hundred years ago. So I would really love to do something, <laughs> something like this. But this is, uh, I think, more and more uh, 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 complicated. But I think it's a very, uh, let's say, uh, important topic to think about this kind of uh, relation. And then I think the the, the last one is. Maybe the most important one for me personally is that that I think in in its essence uh, architecture is very much about the quality of the interior. So it means it's not so much because we are really educated in a way that we always think, okay, we have to design a building and the first thing how the thing looks from the outside. But at the end, this is not so important. I mean, the most important thing is how the thing looks from the inside because the moment when you see a building from the outside is just 20 seconds, while when you are inside you stay there for I don't know hours. And I would, let's say, prefer an architecture that is much more based on the quality of the interior. 
because the interior is nowadays very often forgotten, and it has also to do with with the image culture. We live in a sort of culture of images, and very often the the feeling of the space is not really a, a topic anymore. And I think very much inspired by the swimming pool, because I think it's unbelievable. You go, let's say, on a Monday morning, you go to the swimming pool, and you are, let's say, welcomed by architecture. I mean, that's. In my swimming pool, not the case, you know. I'm welcomed by a hanging ceiling of <laughs> three meter with <laughs> acoustic plates. Thank you very much. prepared in my head which in some way with your final kind of conclusion kind of double images <coughs> I was an of some doubting that would bring it up um, so maybe it brings me to a kind of twofold question because on the one hand I was very intrigued well apart from your insistence to talk about Tessano that at a certain point you show this perspective or sorry this picture of uh, East, well, representing East Germany, and um, there was this kind of uh, crane showing this front on, on that building, and you said, look, uh, the buildings were perhaps negotiating their idea of the future, and that was to a certain extent problematic, but they were made with love, you said. Mm -hmm. And um, of course it made me think of the front on, of the front of the, of the theater of Tessano, <laughs> And uh, in many ways, I realized that, of course, that was exactly that what you somehow declined to engage with. Huh? You explained that too. You said, look, if you come from East Germany, it's very hard to to engage with uh, anything like uh, Venturi or, or whatever, yeah. what you call postmodern discourse. So then again, connecting to to, uh, to Grassi's statement about looking to the past without uh, the illusion about the future. I was wondering, is Tessanov somehow a, a dark horse inside of you, of which an aspect you do not want to reveal? I mean, because there is obviously, I mean, you could have talked about uh, modernists which did not pose you or confront you with that problem, that there is obviously something about an embrace of something older, more traditional, which is still there in the last work of Tessanov as much as in the early work, if you consider it was built in the 20s, 30s, no. where other work was made. And then, I mean, to finish it with, with your last few few perspectives, of course, when you try to sometimes, even in a quite forced way, to compare both, I was like, well, what exactly? And then you maybe, I mean, maybe you introduced a possible answer. You, you talked about the interior. Mm -hmm. Through the interior, I somehow felt you talked implicitly about type. And then I realized, as much as you often talk about type, you did not talk about type at all today. No. <laughs> so, well, you know, in a way, it's a question with two sides. Yeah, I think, it's, it's, let's say, in, in, in that case, it's also a bit, it was a bit an experiment to, <laughs> you know, very often you. I mean, I'm quite aware what I'm talking about, but in that case, I was uh, basically started. I thought, okay, it would be nice to. It's very innocent. Eh? So I thought, okay, let's choose Tessano. Eh? Because, good. because I thought Asplund would be also, I like Asplund also a lot, but then I found out, okay, about Asplund, I cannot really say so much because I'm not from Sweden. I don't know the context and so on. And I think and Tessano was a bit more, let's say, there was a bit more thing to talk about. But at the end, I mean, let's say I'm. I'm I'm an architect, so that means you you come from a sort of visual culture, so you just do it very innocent. I mean, you prepare the lecture, you have the book, you just choose, okay. What, what is that what I like? You put some stickers, uh, and then you take photographs, and then you build up uh, a little a, a little story, and then you discover certain things you you are not aware of, or but they are maybe not conscious, and so on. So I don't know, and it's more like... Uh, but for sure, I mean, the because in the office we never actually normally never talk about Tessano, but it's always there as a sort of yeah, let's say there's a sort of very let's say conscious way of how he did uh, architecture. 
and that we appreciate very much. But we talk very often about knees or let's say shingle in the more in a way that because they are more like yeah, but really. You may be saying that implicitly in the rigor of your own projects there is something hidden like that more than at first glance is visible. My, my point is that that's not simplification. Huh? Yeah. Is is not total simplification. No, 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 no. No, but I think it's also it has also a little bit to do with uh, with the um, let's say. Uh, let's say you, you always come from a certain culture. In our case, this is very. I mean, I'm Catholic, but I come from. I live in an area where the Protestant culture was always very strong. Huh? And then you're really aware there's a difference between Protestant and Catholic countries. And I mean, Tesno is obviously Protestant. Huh? He has this kind of uh, very dry way of turning everything and trying. And then, and we have also a little bit this kind of. Uh, tendency, so we can we appreciate that, but it's not that we, uh, let's say, uh, uh, very obviously try to work in a similar way. But it's more maybe in, in our nature. Maybe that's more I think the the thing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So very often it has also to do with other factors. Uh, let's say that's why I also talked a little bit about the cultural context because you come you are anyway always a bit part of a sort of cultural context, and very often you are not aware of that. And you just become aware of that when you move out of your context and you're confronted with other people and then you appreciate it because when you're a student, you're super enthusiastic about Le Corbusier. Huh? But then you find out, as, this is really funny, you, you really, as a student, I mean, I saw nearly you know, I mean, 80% of 90% of the Corbusier buildings and it was always super enthusiastic. And then you start your own career and then you think, okay, I have these eight books of Corbusier and, you know, I will never look into it again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no discussion, <laughs> not at all, you know, because you just, uh, you understand, but you also find out, I mean, as a German, you can never ever do that kind of stuff, it's impossible, I mean, you cannot, you know, you don't have this kind of poetic, uh, light way of just drawing something and then you're finished, you know, it's not possible, I impossible. Huh? While Mies is a completely different thing, and also Schinkel, and you see, okay, it's more, much more related to construction. And that's something you cannot escape from that, and I think all of you will have the same issue. I mean, it means something when you come from Italy. Eh? They don't have to tell you all when you come from <laughs> Belgium. Eh? That is sort of... Uh, <laughs> and I mean, the only thing I want to say is that uh, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to be somewhere else. Huh? That's a bit the... Yeah, and I use it more as a sort of example, huh, in a way. To yeah, but I, implicitly, I think that with showing Tessanov in your work, yeah. which makes it somehow harder, yeah. we want us to read these very simple buildings also as something which works around principles and, to a certain extent, a kind of cool <laughs> architectural set of themes, yeah. not unlike what he was dealing with, although yeah. it doesn't look like it. No. Because you could put them also in a, a much more modernist tradition, these same buildings, right? Yeah. And that's basically, if you were referring to Hannes Meyer before, yeah. you say, ha, look, they look the same. Yeah. Of course, perhaps not, but yeah. that's they do. But then, then, to a certain extent, there's no tension. I don't know. It was finally your choice to, to show the tension. I think even in the last images, it's still there. Yeah. You know, if you show the two uh, uh, theater halls, yeah. I couldn't be more different, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can claim they're the same, but I mean, that's yeah. in a way absurd. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I got a question which is strangely related to what Catherine was, was asking you, because, I mean, often, no, when you talk about your architecture, but even with, uh, with André, um, you got this, uh, in, in the wars, no, there's this idea of uh, unavo unavoidability, no? Yeah. In a way, it seems that there's no choice. But then, but then no, um, if I think at your obsessions, yeah. like, for example, the obsessions of uh, not showing uh, joints, yeah. of having the biggest possible panel mm. always, no? I think there's a lot of choices, no? And, and you make, obviously, a lot of choices when you, when you make architecture, even in this very reduced uh, language. No? Yeah. In a way, again, there, 
I, I see, let me say, these, these, these choices in, in Tessanov, no? maybe towards different directions, no? towards sort of representational yeah. um, issues, no? sort of totems, whatever. But I see them even in your, in your, in your architecture. No? It's simply that it's not about. I mean, it's simply that the figures are different. No, before there was Caspar uh, David Friedrich, uh, and now there's maybe a Richter. And, but I see the, the the symmetry in the game. Eh? Uh, it wasn't a little. Uh a little sorry, yeah? <laughs> so that's sort of because I mean, what, what should I? Because the problem is, let's say, when you can better, when you, when you want to have a nice talk about uh, Tessano, you can better invite uh, Marco de Michelis because he knows everything. But at the, I mean, yeah, you find always out as an architect at the end you don't know so much, huh? yeah. and you can only, let's say, you have to stick to what you see because very often the story is somehow hidden and it's not so easy to. I mean, you have to. Yeah, but in a way, and, and there's also the way how we look on the things or how we consume. the wooden colonnade of the hospital, yeah. I have the impression that comes to the core of what you like about Tesno. I know you also explained that you're yeah. a kid or not a kid yeah. anymore, but yeah. you tried to see it and it was bulldozed around the same time. Yeah. And of course, uh, probably that wooden colonnade is the closest you can get to contemporary capital in Tesno, right? Because it's Maybe. out of proportion in a yeah. way, it's very technological, it's yeah. this wood. Uh, uh, and it mediates through its, in a way, new facade, a building which is perhaps not even that interesting. No, uh, it's a sort of cover. Yeah, and, and so so that's funny. Mm. So perhaps that's how you enter that that's the whole world. Mm. And then it's but very often it's also even more complicated, you know, when you press. You know, what is also is, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we went quite often to Berlin and you were this size, you know, and then you see, you come and you walk through and then you see Altus Museum, you think, Jesus Christ, you know. And then you go to... Then you, you go to, to Neuerwache, eh? the, the interior of Tessano, and there were these two soldiers standing, and then you go there inside, and then you think, oh, you know? Yeah. But that, that's also this kind of stuff, I mean, and it's not, I mean, it's also a bit, you cannot completely separate it. It's not the sort of, I mean, architecture is not, what I also want to say, I mean, architecture is not, uh, it's not a completely only intellectual activity. It's a sort of part of your emotional experience, and very often you, you also don't know why you like certain things, and it has to do that you're used to it, or you know, or you're. And that's also a bit of mystery of, and that makes it also nice, I think. And you have to. Any questions from the public, perhaps? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first time I attended cycle lectures, and it's really, I think, very interesting to see this kind of intuitive relationships between. Women your like intimate references. And I have a question and then maybe sort of a hypothesis. And then <laughs> maybe try to answer this. Or it's a feature of the new series. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's something you said twice without explaining is that you don't like Stuckel. Yeah. And um, if you, I, I would ask you just to go to this picture that compares the theater with your theater, the beach and the uh, on that theater, you also specified that you didn't want to use Stucco. And, uh, and no, I mean, this one. This one. And I, my hypothesis is <laughs> that I think that maybe you take from him this idea of uh, this kind of uh, crude minimalism, this aestheticism, which in him has this tone that's very Protestant and almost moralistic. And in yours, maybe has a more like pragmatic and economical uh, tone, which maybe has something to do with you working in Holland. Yeah. Because his sort of uh, aestheticism, like this building is public, but at the same time feels very domestic and very rural and kind of agricultural and has this kind of, it looks like still a house yeah, yeah. and it's just overscaled. And while yours, your, your kind of aestheticism tends towards abstraction, you know, it, it feels more industrial because it has no. Um, detail because we didn't use Stucco, so I was wondering if maybe that's where you diverge. I don't know for sure, maybe we don't have this kind of issue that you want to make something that reminds on the traditional house or something that's not, but but still, I mean, because I think this one is, is 
the temporary villas look like that. Yeah, no, 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 but it's more, I think at the end, it's also more about, let's say, dealing with proportion and a certain relation with, with scale. I mean, what is, let's say, interesting about that one is the scale because it looks, looks much smaller than it is in reality because of the fact that this is four meter and you think it looks like 260 and, and everything is in the doors are four meter by four. And that's here also a little bit the case. So it's more, but it also wants to remind on something, but the question is on what, huh? <laughs> no, but it's, 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 that was for, for was here also an issue because when you make a theater, then it should look also a bit like, it should look like a concert hall, but at the same time you notice, okay, I mean, it's a, it's a different thing and the conditions are also different. And then, and then it, let's say you want to remind on a theater, but at the same time you want to also show that it is something else. And that's also very often the case, I think. And I think the, because housing is a bit more, I think in general, a bit more easy uh, profession because in housing, housing is more pragmatic, I think, while when you do a public building, you always talk about a sort of meaning because you have to communicate with a sort of audience and the audience should also understand the gestures. And that's why I mentioned also these kind of focus on the on the public elements what we like very much on people like Boulay or Schindler that there is a sort of in a way that they try to work on the public expression whatever that might be huh? let's say so they don't when you make a public building they don't work on something they work on the public elements and they always try to find out what are really the public elements so, Thanks. More questions? Yeah, yeah. come on. Please, one. Yeah, about the uh, IKEA classicism. It's more a question if it's like more a, a slogan or a motto for your office, or you're really doing like a research on it or try to create a catalog? No, I mean, let's say, let's say the, 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 the aspect is, let's say, we come from Holland, eh? that we, we learned quite a lot there. Eh? And, and one of the one of the one, one of the issues is that you sometimes have to shorten the story a little bit and keep the subtlety for yourself just to make your make your point let's say and uh, the the point is a bit what I think is that when you look at uh, um, let's say contemporary condition of our profession then I think in at least in our case I think eighty or ninety percent of the of the commissions we have architecture is not super important. We are not hired because we are super fantastic uh, architects and everybody wants to have a sort of uh, capital building, but it's more like that the very often there's a sort of pressure on economic uh, circumstances. They want to have a certain uh, uh, performance. And I think architecture is very often a hidden part of the agenda. It's a bit like a tr so we always see it a bit like a sort of uh, Trojan horse. Huh? You come in, you bring it in, and then, <laughs> and then you do your job, but you have a sort of hidden agenda. Huh? And hidden agenda is then architecture, huh? because there are, I mean, sometimes you have clients that really want architecture, but it's not so often, very often when you do, I don't know, when you do a social housing project and people, uh, let's say, not interested in architecture, even, uh, what they hate you because you do architecture. Huh? Very often, you, they, first you have to convince them to make, that they hire you, and then they find out, oh, these guys are nasty and so on and then just want to get rid of you and then you know because in then in that way I think it's a bit uh, it's a bit in the thing and very often just to explain you let's say also how it works very often we have always this funny story about this model let's say how it works with the with <coughs> with architecture we designed this we designed this building yeah then we had this model, and then the, the building was too expensive, <laughs> like so often. Huh? And then you come with this model to the client, and then, and then you sit there, we sit on the table, and then you say, okay, hmm, it's too expensive, what can we do? And then, every, and then you sit on the table, and you think, okay, I thought, eh? ah, they would just cut a bit off to make it smaller, and so on. And then, but everybody immediately agreed, no, we cannot make that smaller, because otherwise we make ourselves ridiculous. And it has just to do because of the fact that people are not able to understand architecture because when you look at the model and you think, okay, yeah, you cannot make it smaller because you relate yourself to the elements you see. So you see the door and you think, okay, <laughs> if I stand here, let's say, <laughs> and I make it smaller, then it's very lousy. <laughs> but then you come at the opening and people are standing here and they are like this size, you know, <laughs> and then they think, fuck you. <laughs> so it is, it, it's very often also a bit the, the, the play, but I think, Let's say in our case, very often the, 
the conditions are, let's say, or we describe the conditions as very problematic because of the fact that we are always interested in a certain scale. We want to have a certain monumental scale because we think it's necessary to have pleasant spaces. When you make a public building, it needs a certain height. I think this, for instance, is not, I think it's too low. I mean, it could be a bit higher if it would be. It. <laughs> yeah. So. Last question. Okay. Uh, for, <laughs> uh, in, in the image between, uh, where there is the row housing from Tessino and, and from yourself, there, there is an interesting situation kind of going on. Because in a way, if we leave aside any uh, sophisticated, let's say, <laughs> reading, it's, it's funny how both like Tessino's architecture and your own belong to the same kind of category that is a kind of a normal category. Uh, as, as you're kind of saying, uh, Tesno is, is in this position like between avoiding nostalgia but then again avoiding also this kind of very optimistic, very uh, future oriented uh, position. So in a way it's very diff difficult to see uh, in beforehand how this thing will go on. Because you, you talked a lot about maybe the, few, the, the past, somehow like Tesma's position and your own patents. But uh, maybe we, we could stop a uh, two seconds and think about how the, so the right part, the right hand of this uh, couple will evolve in the, as an image. Because in a way, the left hand side image is like, still quite a familiar image, and okay. it evolved in a very certain way. It became like this kind of uh, image of normality somehow. And uh, do you think that what you're doing has this kind of same uh, attitude towards maybe the future? Do you think it, it will be the normal, uh, almost banal, maybe, but I, I mean, uh, not essentially in a bad way, but uh, do you think it's this kind of intention? No, that's difficult to say. I mean, because that would mean that you should already now that you should now already say something about uh, the future. But I think for us, it's let's say more like that. We, I mean, when we design something like this, then it's more like based on our own fascination. Huh? So I think let's say when it, that's a bit, bit the point. When you do housing project, you can do it actually from two different ways. You can do it as a sort of cynic operation, and that means you just say, okay, people want somehow that, and then you do your thing. Huh? Or you say, I try to design it in a way that I could imagine that I myself would live in the thing. And we always try to do that because of the fact that at the end, more convincing to start from your own, uh, let's say, view on reality. And yeah, I'm not sure if this is relevant in the, in the long run. I have no idea about that, but I think, uh, but I always say to the clients, okay, I mean, there are at least other people that also like that and those are the guys who buy that and why not building for these people because I mean if you want to have something else and you go somewhere else so I think this is more the, the issue with it. but but I'm not so sure if this is a sort of model that is really relevant for the for the future I don't know I don't know there is no such position yeah, because you know, we always thought, let's say, let's say we have always this idea of this kind of, but this is a typical architect thing, you, you think you develop a certain prototype and the prototype can at a certain moment be repeated. But very often this is not the case, you know, because conditions change and, you know. But specifically here, what changes is that these enormous class facades you can already not build anymore today. Insulation, insulation rules change, but, but we have, exactly, we have now the probably only built for, uh, Catholic users, so you have to do something else. I mean, you know, when you build in Belgium or in in in, in France, then you do then you do a different you do a different thing. You find a different way, and, and very often, I mean, the architecture is very much related also to the to the conditions that are there. So, for instance, technical conditions. So, in Belgium, we do now always with concrete elements popping out 60 centimeters and just to make a lot of glass, but avoid the fire because the fire rules are. So it's I don't know. There's always I mean. And especially so also in the social housing, I mean, you know, it's, there are so many conditions and at the end you're very happy if you manage within all these conditions to do something that looks nice, then you're already the master. There's not so much time to, in the housing to really think. <laughs> yeah? 
And when you do social housing in Paris, I mean, there are only rules, 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 and then you just try to find your way within all these kind of, and you, you know, you design architecture around the circles of the wheelchair. Huh? So, so I don't know, I cannot say something about that, if this has a sort of a future or not, because I, I have no idea. So in a way, there's a nice parallel between this and the fire, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the initial Berlin thing. Because, uh, yeah, very often, I mean, in architecture, I mean, especially in the housing, I mean, 90% of what you see is given by someone else. There are only uh, government rules, uh, subsidies, building rules, and so on. I mean, you're, I mean, at the end, I mean, I think, let's say the, the, the design work of the architect is, I think, 5% uh, of his work, and, and the half of the time he is designing uh, bathrooms and staircases. I mean, so it's not so... I mean, they do a lot of, I mean, the work is, <laughs> it's not only about design, actually. <laughs> At the end, the design is very, you always wonder, I mean, you always wonder, because you do a tender, and then you may come, come up, you have a design, huh? and then you think, hey, okay. but then five years later, you make a building, looks somehow similar, and then you always wonder, what did you do in the meantime? What happened in these five years or six years? And you worked like hell, you know? There were a lot of fights that you lost or you have won, but... Uh, <laughs> Positive note about the profession. <laughs> 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 <laughs>